I have a disclaimer to share from our presenters this evening, and they would like you to know that the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by these speakers are solely theirs and do not represent the opinions of the U.S. Army War College or that of the U.S. military. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our director, Lacey Love. Hello, everyone. Um, like Sydney said, my name is Lacey. I am the new director of the Peters Township Public Library. Um, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as you can see on the screen, this is the 15th consecutive year that the Peters Township Library has been lucky enough to partner with the US Army War College for a program. And although she couldn't be here tonight, I would just like to acknowledge Margaret Dietzer, who has coordinated these events for the past 14 years. And so we are kind of just picking up where she left off and I'd like to thank her for all the hard work she put into that. So thank you for coming tonight and enjoy the program. And I will now hand it off to our presenters. Thank you, I appreciate that. I also would like to thank Margaret for helping the War College get established I wanted to say thank you to the Peters Township Public Library for inviting the students of the Army War College to be part of this annual event for the last 15 years. It's pretty impressive. So Lacey and Sydney, thank you also for help, helping us set this up this evening. In the past, our fellow War College students were able to do like presentations in person, but due to current health conditions, we're presenting to you from our homes here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I certainly hope that we can get back to the in-person sessions next year. I'm gonna introduce my teammates in the order that they'll be presenting this evening. Uh, first is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Knoll. If you can come up on screen there, he'll wave to you. Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Knoll is a native of Dallas, Texas, and he attended the United States Military Academy, also known as West Point. He earned a bachelor's degree of science in environmentally, environmental engineering and a field artillery branch commission. So he's a field artillery officer. Later, he also earned a master's degree from the University of Texas, Austin, and he has served in multiple countries, had multiple wartime deployments, and has had multiple commands, with his most recent command being a battalion commander of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment Field Artillery Squadron. Next, I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel John Wilcox. He is a graduate of the Virginia Military Institute, VMI, where he earned his commission as a military police corps officer. As a Lieutenant Colonel, John volunteered to join the Civil Affairs Regiment and attended the Civil Affairs Qualification Course, or Q Course. He later was an advisor to the, to the First Special Forces Group, and on top of his multiple command roles and deployments, he was the battalion commander for the First Special Force Special Warfare Training Group. He has conducted worldwide civil affairs in support of special operations in ambiguous and complex environments. Next is Lieutenant Colonel Steve Thibodeau. He is a native of Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and attended the University of Rhode Island, where he earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in political science and a field artillery branch commission. He has also served in multiple countries and returned from a, just recently from a deployment from Iraq in July of 2020. He has, as well, multiple commands, and his most recent command being the battalion commander of the 2nd Battalion, 8th Field Artillery Regiment out of Fort Wainwright, Alaska. Next is Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Semerow. She received her commission as a pilot training candidate from Virginia Tech. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Virginia Tech as well, and a Master's in Arts in Human Resource Management from Webster University. Prior to her arrival at Carlisle Barracks, she was the commander of the 56th Rescue Squadron in Aviano Air Base, Italy. Not only has she served notably in many command assignments, but she did so successfully at the Pentagon in Okinawa, Japan. She worked for the Royal Air Force in England and was with the Combined Joint Task Force on the Horn of Africa. I am Colonel John Ament. I was born in Gross Point, Michigan. I later attended Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona, achieving a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. Later, I went on to achieve a Master's in Business Administration and a second Master's in Healthcare Administration. Like my peers, I've served in multiple locations around the world, two combat deployments, recently finished a success and recently finished my battalion command as a medical recruiting commander. Next slide, please. Now onto the question that you may have about this topic and why the Army War College is talking about it. Well, China's military is able to be global and is. In the coming decade, the People's Liberation Army of China 
could be well positioned to influence events and conduct a wide range of missions, including war fighting around the world. The United States and its allies and partners who have enjoyed largely unobstructed access to the world's oceans for the last three decades will need to adjust to new military realities as the People's Liberation Army of China makes its presence felt in distant areas beyond its shores. I will now give an overview of some of the definition and concepts that will help us understand the panel's presentations this evening. In front of you on the slide, you can see the CIA Global Power Index. It is one of the sources that you can use to look up to show that China is the second main global superpower after the United States. This index factors in military, economic, technological, political, and demographic strengths. In further detail, power is created when a country has a desirable geographic position or positions, a population that can support it, natural resources, industrial capacity, capability, military, pre military preparedness, a high quality diplomacy and governance, that is reliable and consistent. Next slide. In the military, we refer to the instruments of national power as the tools a country uses to influence other countries. The United States national, the United States national security strategy is, a mandated, is mandated by Congress and is the principal document that lays out how the president plans to use these instruments of power to achieve U.S. national security objectives. A nation's power to impose its will and to achieve its nation's objectives is derived from these instruments of national power. It does, however, have to be skillfully managed uh, and, synergistic, and synergistic in order to achieve its desired results. Next slide. We're also gonna be talking about the relationships with China, US, IR theory, and the Department of Defense competition continuum. International relations theory, or IR theory, is the international relations from a theoretical perspective. It attempts to provide a conceptual framework upon which international relations can be analyzed. Furthermore, we use this to help us look at the same world situations in different ways or different perspectives. And then we have the ability to choose from those perspectives to help us view and understand and make sense of the world around us. And we do that through all these various different lenses. In short, IR theory is why different countries do what they do or to justify what they do from their lens. The last concept I wanted to share was on the Department of Defense competition continuum. This discusses some of the implications for how the adversarial, at the adversarial level that the US military campaigns and how this is done through cooperation at a level below armed conflict and then at the level of armed conflict. In short, it states, it, it, in short, as states and non-state actors seek to protect and advance their own interests, they'll continually compete for diplomatic, economic, and strategic advantages. Next slide. Now that I have, now that you have an understanding of the, ma the major military conflict theories and concepts, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Knoll to dive deeper into China-U.S. IR theory from past to present. Over to you, Chuck. Thank you, John, and uh, to everyone and all the ladies and gentlemen in attendance uh, this evening. It's it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, as someone who's not from Pennsylvania, but uh, as a military. Uh, family that moves from place to place, I'd like to thank this this incredible community for welcoming us there and our children into this area. And so I, I from the bottom of my heart, I, I really appreciate uh, this area here and I'll always think fondly of it. Um, but I'll get to the point here, which is what we're talking about here is uh, our relationship with, with China. And so once again, I, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Knoll and uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is give you a, a kind of a brief stage setter on U.S. People's Republic, that's Communist China's kind of historical interactions and their international relation approaches that's going to provide you greater context as my colleagues later on discuss current military information and economic uh, issues and approaches that are going on. So let me start with kind of current uh, United States national security strategy docu documents, and this is both from the Trump and Biden administrations that are describing China as the following. 
They're seeking to challenge American power, influence, and interest in attempting to erode American security and prosperity. Pacing challenge, strategic competitor, seeks Indo-Pacific regional hegemony in the near term and displacement of the United States to achieve global preeminence in the future. Primary concern for US national security, strategic competition defined by geopolitical rivalry between a free and a repressive world order version. China's recent assertiveness, their, their regional aspirations and desire for great power status derive from what they call the China's century of humiliation, which occurred from uh, roughly 1839 to 1949. Uh, this period is defined by great defeats and trade manipulation by foreign powers, such as the Russians, French, British, Japanese, among others, uh, with conflicts such as you might hear of the, the Boxer Rebellion, Opium Wars, and finally the Japanese invasions of Manchuria and mainland China uh, and pre-US uh, entering the Second World War, as well as in internal fragmentation of the country. Etched into the Chinese psyche is a sense of maintaining honor, nationalism, and the sovereignty and integrity of the historic Chinese territory. That includes the mainland, that includes Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the associated islands. The end of this century of humiliation period uh, occurs when the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek are defeated. They flee to Taiwan, and Chairman Mao and the Communist Party declared the official People's Republic of China in 1949, the PRC, People's Republic of China. The U.S. continues to recognize Chiang Kai-shek's Republic of Korea, the, the democratic government uh, on Taiwan is the legitimate government of all of China. And then later on, we find ourselves on the opposite sides of the Korean War with the People's Republic, the communist side of China. The People's Republic of China and U.S. relations maintain the status quo for nearly a quarter of a century. And then due to Sino-Soviet deterring relations and the U.S. potential to gain a uh, diplomatic competitive advantage in the Cold War, it wasn't until President Nixon's reapproachment with the People's Republic of China uh, did we enter a new phase. So central to this reproachment was the establishment of, of diplomatic relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China, as well as what you're going to hear about is the three Sino-American communiques in 1972, 1979, and 18, 1982. The first communique uh, acknowledges with the, has the U.S. acknowledging that there is only one China and Taiwan is a part of China. The second communique, the U.S. recognizes the People's Republic of China, the Communist China, as the sole legal government of China, and it ends formal relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan. However, it does preserve economic and cultural ties with Taiwan. The third communique, discusses U.S. arms sales to Taiwan and how it's contingent upon the commitment of the People's Republic of China seeking a peaceful solution across the Taiwan Straits. So the United States recognizing China's early economic potential, its usefulness in Soviet containment strategy and, and diplomatic successes, the U.S. enters into a period of what we call liberal international relations theory in which uh, with, with China in the hopes that by working within international venues and constructs such as the United Nations, a seat at the UN Security Council, uh, eventually the World Trade Organization, China's behavior would modify into a fair rules-based approach while respecting international norms, much like you see with Germany and Japan post-World War II. However, Chinese uh, military modernization and concerns over the full territory unification, Taiwan, maritime boundaries and the Paracels and Spratly Islands with Vietnam and the Philippines, and the desire for influ in, uh, increased influence in Asia led to a period of assertiveness beginning in the 1990s that escalated a lot of tensions between the United States and the People's Republic of China. A handful of these events, and you'll see on that slide, you know, Obviously, the, the 1989 uh, Tiananmen Square incident, that's obviously etched in a lot of people's minds here. The 1995-1996 Taiwan Strait crisis that was spurred by Taiwanese pro-independence aspirations uh, prior to an election, and the United States kind of simultaneously or near simultaneously granting the Taiwanese president a visa and kind of showing recognition of him. Uh, China, you know, during this crisis kind of applied pressure by conducting a series of missile tests over Taiwan and the addition of multiple large-scale mock amphibious invasions of Taiwan, resulting in the United States sending two carrier strike groups to, to kind of reduce 
apprehensions there. Um, obviously, this was, you could see why the PRC did this, the People's Republic of China did this, either demonstrating the resolve and maintaining the one China policy. Another incident was the 1997, uh, you know, that's when the UK returned Hong Kong. There was much diplomatic pressure and informational efforts in there to, to achieve that. The 1999 accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. Um, and there was a lot of subsequent uh, anti-US demonstrations, pretty violent in China at the time. And then many of y'all might remember the 2001 uh, Chinese fighter collision with the US uh, Navy EP3 reconnaissance plane over the South China Sea um, and the detainment of that crew. And I think the word collision is used a little lightly. I think reporting really demonstrates that it was an aggressive intercept there that caused that crash. All in all, these assertive actions fall into China's interest of maintaining uh, this sense of nationalism and honor regaining and protecting the historic territory of China and expanding Chinese influence in Asia while, while diminishing that of the United States, frankly. Over the last two decades, and even with the enticements such as the entry into the World Trade Organization, military exchanges, the United States government uh, enacting most favorable trade nation, uh, trade nation, uh, nation trade agreements and the hopes of liberalizing, liberalizing Chinese behavior, um, Frankly, the, the People's Republic of China continues an aggressive competition strategy to serve the national, uh, national interest that I described earlier. Although the military instrument of power over the last two decades uh, is diminished, diminished a little bit, is not as aggressive as it was with collisions of aircraft and, the, and, uh, and, uh, amphib and mock amphibious invasions of Taiwan, the military is still at play. Um, and this long-term strategy, what they're developing now, involves greater reliance on the economic, informational, di uh, diplomatic levers that coerce other nations and get what they need out of them. Um, this can be seen through their Belt and Road Investment Initiative, predatory lending practices, economic practices, cyber activities, and military modernization and their development of anti-access area denial capabilities in the uh, South China Lee, uh, Sea and along the first island chains around the Pacific. China is one of the countries, is, is the only one country that has the capacity to both be a military and economic superpower. And the US strategy must maintain the competitive advantage along with its allies while fostering, while in the hopes of still fostering Chinese integrations, uh, integration of the rules and norms of the international system, as well as strategic and rational cooperation to prevent crisis escalation. Again, I thank you for your time. Uh, looking forward to the end answer questions. And I'm gonna be followed by Lieutenant Colonel John Wilcox, who will further discuss the economic and information comp uh, competition space in greater detail. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Chuck. Uh, I wanna echo my, uh, my colleagues' uh, feelings on uh, thanks to both the library and all of you for attending this evening. Uh, I assure you that uh, if you're disappointed that we're not there in person, we are more so disappointed uh, we've spent quite a deal, a, a bit of our, our time at the War College, unfortunately, doing the same thing we're doing right now. So uh, we relish the opportunity to get out uh, and speak with you directly. But um, thank you very much for your attendance. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking a little bit about the information and economic space. And uh, as you heard earlier in the introductions, I spent 16 of my 22 years in uh, special operations as a civil affairs officer. And if I've learned anything in that time, it's that the information and data propagation are only going to become more prevalent as technology expands. And the information space is only going to get more important in how nations operate and interact. And so the natural ties between information and the economy mean that they both share some critical vulnerabilities that we as a nation must identify, must protect, and then build appropriate policies and strategy to respond to our opponents. President Biden's been very clear in his intent to reinvigorate key alliances and return the United States to a global influence through multilateral means. The last few years, we've seen a considerable rise in Chinese expansionist efforts and financial practices to enable its vision for the future via China uh, 2049, which you may or may not be uh, uh, familiar with, but it is their roadmap for the future. To achieve this goal, the Chinese Communist Party routinely exploits gaps in existing international law and the information space to expand Chinese influence. Americans generally resist monitoring and censoring of public information as it is one of our core tenets in the first, caught in the First Amendment. The Chinese have no such policy though. Much of the CCP's approach in the information, data, and infrastructure uh, attacks is that everything is fair game. From a Chinese perspective, 
Much of this, this activity falls under the category of competition in the context of Sun Tzu, and it is legitimate business policy. So the U.S. must focus on how to respond to Chinese exploitation of these spaces if we intend to remain competitive in a world where Chinese influence is only going to become more global. By way of background, the emerging Biden administration policy, which is still in development, but has placed China as what we're calling the pacing threat for the United States. And part of the reason for this is because uh, since 2000, there were 137 Chinese-linked espionage cases against the United States. 73% of those have occurred in the last decade. At any given time, the FBI has around 1,000 investigations open into Ch Chinese technology and intellectual property theft. And the theft of American trade secrets by China cost the United States anywhere between 300 and 600 billion, that's billion with a B, a year are up to 0.87% of our GDP. The original 2016 TTP of which we took part covered nearly 40% of the global economy and excluded China. Though it did have, did have some flaws, this arrangement would have placed the United States in a highly desirable position to influence key relationships and deals while enabling the United States economy to diversify its options in the region to respond to Chinese expansion. After the US exit, a second group of nations entered an agreement that's titled the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or the RCEP, which includes 15 Asia Pacific countries and covers nearly one third of the world's population and GDP, and it does include China. Leaving the TTP out, or leaving our departure from the TTP left the US out of key economic deals, and it removed US representation in peripheral economic and diplomatic agreements associated with the TTP. Now, data infrastructure, as I mentioned, across the region is a critical vulnerability. Communications networks and civilian business nodes are critical to the highly technical nature of economic expansion in the region. Nations like China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran all routinely target and exploit weaknesses in the information infrastructure around the world. These attacks include things like denial of service attacks, information or uh, disinformation campaigns, intellectual property theft, and social engineering. The Chinese Communist Party's goals simply run counter to American ideals and American interests. Moving forward, everything we do in China must be based on a trust but verify mechanism for an emerging market society. We cannot do business as usual with the Chinese because our society is built with a, the expectation to follow rule of law. Uh, the Chinese society is not built that way. A multinational agreement is needed to form uh, and then apply pressure on the CCP to comply with established international norms of conduct. CCP leaders believe they have a narrow window of strategic opportunity right now to strengthen their, in, their position and revise the international order in their favor while the United States and our allies work to close those vulnerability gaps that I mentioned. The CCP simply has no, no intention of playing by the rules associated with international law, trade, or commerce. Chinese, China's overall strategy relies on co-option and coercion at home and abroad. What makes this status, uh, strategy potent and dangerous it is, is that the integrated nature of the party's efforts include, uh, are, are cross-cutting across government, industry, academia, and the military, and that makes it very hard to combat. But the Chinese do have some vulnerabilities. The coronavirus pandemic and last year's riots in Hong Kong expose the fact that the party relies on strict control of information to maintain order within its borders and its population. The more their hold on information slips, the less control they have. You heard about the Belt and Road Initiative earlier. This, the part of the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, a $1 trillion call, or call for $1 trillion in um, infrastructure investments across the Indo-Pacific region, uh, Eurasia, and, and more. Uh, but this expansion requires resources that exist outside of China, and this has led to considerable Chinese investment in other countries where development deals are offered in exchange for access to resources and raw materials. But more often than not, these deals are extremely skewed in favor to China. So while the BRI puts China at the hub of trade routes and communication networks in Central and South Asia, due to Chinese predatory lending practices and economic deals that overwhelmingly favor the Chinese, many nations are realizing that Chinese investment comes with severe strings attached. So to conclude, some question whether military conflict between China and the United States may be inevitable. By many measures, the United States and China are very much in a state of active conflict, just not a military one. But I contend that this so-called Thucydides trap is far from inevitable. 
China's reliance on information attacks, infrastructure, and economic warfare are all correctable vulnerabilities. These, coupled with China's abysmal record on climate and human rights, are all weaknesses that the U.S. must exploit. Although the CCP leveraged the unifying power of a strong central and authoritarian government, that rise to power hinges on strict and rigid control of their population through information management. So there's no need to pursue military confrontation. Through allied partnerships and a more results-oriented policy directly with China, we can still enjoy a positive relationship, but one that is governed by clear regulatory and legal guidelines. Between opportunities like a return to the TPP, which is now called the CPTPP, the United States would be back in a position of economic and information influence in the region. It would give us economic options, trade and diplomatic options, and we could put greater pressure on China to follow the internationally agreed rules and regulations which most nations follow. China's unilateral control of Southeast Asia is far from preordained, and given the potential economic benefits to all countries involved, competing with China is far more desirable than conflict. I'm now gonna hand off to Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Thibodeau. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Steve Thibodeau. Tonight, uh, I want to give a comprehensive overview of how the United States military competes with and deters Chinese military aggression uh, throughout the region uh, and really throughout the world. Uh, on the slide, you can read a headline from this week published on the Department of Defense's website. It reads, erosion of U.S. strength in Indo-Pacific is dangerous to us all. Uh, commander says, well, that does not sound very optimistic coming from the commander of Indo-PACOM, who, as you can see on the map, uh, is at the tip of the spear when we talk about military co competition with China. I can assure you that while the headlines like these certainly may foretell doom and gloom of an adversary who stands 10 feet tall uh, and who shoots lasers from their eyes, uh, it is not all that dire. I'll focus on how the United States, through U.S. Indo-PACOM successfully competes daily with China by highlighting our overarching strategy for the region and supporting those with our strategic goals uh, throughout the entire area. First, let's revisit the Global Power Index that John showed earlier. Uh, if, you, if you recall, that graphically depicts the United States with a seemingly sizable lead on China in a host of areas. When we break it down further and we just focus on Asia, uh, which is the chart in the bottom right of this slide, you can see it's a lot closer race. That index from the Lowy Institute shows that not only is China a very close section, second uh, when we focus on Asia, their trajectory is ascending in the region, uh, while ours is on a slight decline. To quote the commander of Indo-PACOM, Admiral Phil Davidson, uh, without a valid and convincing conventional deterrent, China will be emboldened to take action to supplant the established rules-based international order. So what is at stake? And why should we be in great power competition? Looking toward our first goals uh, in the region will kind of give us a reason uh, why competing with China helps deter some of their aggression. Uh, number one, you can see on the slide, uh, defend the homeland and American citizens abroad, prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and the means from de delivering them to preserve US economic, diplomatic and military access to the most populous region of the world and more than third of the world's global economy. Our second goal, enhance credibility and effectiveness of our alliances. And three, maintain US primacy in the region while protecting American core values and liberties at home. These described goals lead to many desired outcomes in the region. However, specifically regarding China, we, along with our partners, remain resistant to Chinese activities aimed at undermining sovereignty and we leverage all of our aspects of that influence. Our goals are certainly quite broad and could be argued aspirational in many respects. Essential for this discussion, I think we narrow in on Indo-PACOM's military objectives as they, specific, as they specifically relate to China. Uh, first, uh, always and underlying everything that we do is deter, deterring China from using their military force against the United States, our allies, or our partners in developing capabilities and concepts to defeat the Chinese actions across the spectrum of conflict. With that objective in mind, some critical operations across the region are focused on, ach on achieving those, that objective. First, denying China air and sea dominance inside the first island chain in a conflict. Uh, you can see on the map uh, kind of the, the island chain that they're talking about, although it is really small, 
but that is really near uh, and close in towards China. Uh, a report Monday uh, in the National Defense Magazine is that Indo-PACOM is seeking roughly $9 billion to move forces closer to China over the next six years uh, in order to get, at, get after that air and sea dominance inside of that island chain. Uh, second, defending our partners inside of that first island chain. Uh, Taiwan and Chinese aggression uh, toward their sovereignty are frequently in the news. On Tuesday, Admiral Davidson said, Taiwan is clearly one of China's ambitions. I think that the threat is manifest during this decade, in fact, in fact potentially in the next six years. You may recall last month, the United States moved two carrier groups into the South China Sea, conducting exercises, signaling to Beijing our resolve to defend our partners. And then third, uh, our goal is to dominate all domains, namely air, sea, land, space, and cyberspace, outside of the first island chain nearest in towards China. Uh, outside of China's immediate area, we need to leverage all aspects of military power to not only compete uh, with Chinese, but to dominate them uh, across those domains. Militarily throughout the region, we help our allies and partners improve their security, enhance their military capabilities, and to also establish interoperability with all of our allies and partners, ensuring first their independence uh, and freedom from Chinese coercion. Expanding military partnerships to all like-minded nations will continually limit China's abilities and tamper their aggression. As we look closer at the Asia Power Index, we see that although China may be edging closer to ascending to the top position, of the 17 countries depicted, 14 of those countries are allies or partners of the United States. In comparison, China may potentially receive favorable relations from two of the countries in the top 17, but they indeed cannot be depended on as allies. Ending where we started, while the headline and multiple other headlines you see in the news may seem dire that the United States, I can assure you that the United States remains ready to fight and win across Indo-PACOM while competing and winning below the level of armed conf conflict, protecting our vital national interests in the region while defending the sovereignty of our partners and allies. Thank you again for inviting us this evening. I will be followed by Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Samrao, who will discuss in depth the Chinese military. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Steve. So let me first echo my colleagues here and say it's a sincere pleasure to spend some time with you this evening. I am a native of Pennsylvania, so I had the pleasure of growing up not far here from the Army War College. So it's a pleasure to be home for a time period. I also had the pleasure to serve out in the PACOM uh, area of operations. And I can tell you it's, it's complex, right? So we have our work cut out for us, just like Stephen was just talking about. So for my portion this evening, I'm going to discuss a little bit about who the Chinese military is in competition. And I think really to get after that question, we look at two aspects of it to start with, right? That's who the military leadership is, what direction they're going to set, and then how they're organized to be able to affect the direction they want to go. And before I get started here, I'll say, I see some great questions populating in the, in the chat. So please keep those coming and we look forward to answering them. So first of all, starting off with China's military leadership, so it was mentioned earlier that the Central Military Commission is an arm of the Chinese Communist Political Party, right? So the military of China, is that's kind of a misnomer in that the military is actually the military of the Chinese Communist Party. It just so happens at the moment that the chairman, Xi Jinping, is also the president of China itself. So Xi Jinping sets that direction for the military itself. And what they're seeking to do, starting in 2015, was to modernize their military forces. And really, they have a three-part um, approach to modernization that starts with mechanization. So what you see right now coming from the Chinese military is that mechanization efforts, where they have a lot of new equipment coming online, a lot of new military capability. You'll see the missiles displayed, and you'll see um, the new aircraft coming online uh, and that types of uh, capability. Following the 2020 initiative for mechanization, what they're seeking is 2035 initiative to get to modernization. And what modernization means to them is the ability to conduct systems on systems warfare. 
So that's where their cyber truly comes online and they're able to get inside their adversaries systems and maybe attrit those systems before we ever get to armed combat with one another. And then their ultimate goal is 2049. And that's what they call informatized warfare. And informatized warfare is seeking to bring artificial intelligence and other new age technologies online to do more of an annihil annih annihilation. So it's a kind of a three part stepping stone of, of what they're working towards to achieve. And to get from their 2020 mechanization strategy to their 2035 mechanization stra uh, modernization strategy, what they did is reorganize their forces. So when Chuck spoke earlier, Lieutenant Colonel Knoll spoke earlier, he was speaking about an army, a defensive system that was primarily focused to internal defense of China's territorial boundaries. So they have very large maneuver force that was focused on ground operations and how to protect mainland China itself. What they're evolving towards now, you can see on the bottom of the slide here, are their theater commands and altering what their services and support services do. So if you look, the theater commands are what they're called their joint commands now, and those are their war fighting commands. They were just stood up. And they earned the responsibility to conduct operations. So if you want to affiliate it to, to US style of uh, military operations, it'd be similar to combatant commanders. So you have an Easter Theater Command, and that's focused out towards Taiwan. You have the Southern Theater that's focused into the South China Sea. You have the Western Theater that's focused towards India. You have the Northern Theater, which focuses north, and you have the Central Theater. And uh, the Central Theater is where I see most of the Air Forces populate. And in your Southern Theater is where you see most of your Navy forces populate. And then the Army is spread throughout all those forces. And if you go over to their services and their support services, the Army went from a land maneuver force about 2 million strong, and they downsized to about a million. And what they're looking to do is to be able to mobilize their military for global operations. Their Navy is seeking to get from just their territorial waters into the ability to, to progress farther for global operations as well. Their Air Force is seeking capability, not only in uh, fighter aircraft, right, strategic bombing aircraft, but also in transport aircraft. Their rocket force used to be their artillery force, and now what that moved is it takes care of all their internet, intercontinental ballistic missiles and everything that you would see in that realm. The Joint Logistics Force is one of the new forces they brought online, and that's exactly what, what it sounds like. That is a force that is responsible for supplying logistics to all those theater commands as they move their forces around. Now, the, uh, the Strategic Support Force is the one I think that we really need to watch here going into the future. So the strate Strategic Support Force is one of the new commands they brought online, and it's responsible for their cyber activities, it's responsible for their information warfare activities. And it's also responsible for psychological warfare. So that's the one where when we talk about that 2035 milestone of systems on systems destruction type warfare, the strategic support force is really working on that. And according to the most recent uh, Department of Defense report on China military power, that strategic support force is focusedly, focused building their capability exclusively right now against the United States. So that's just a really quick overview on the leadership and how the, uh, the, the military is organized. Um, I can keep going here or we could dive into questions as we're really close to the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Samara. That was awesome. And I think we should get into some of the questions because they're, they're starting to populate here and it looks like some people would like to get some more information. And the way that I see that they're coming in, I think the first one, uh, Chuck, uh, you might, Lieutenant Colonel Noel might be the best one to answer. Then the next one might be uh, between uh, Lieutenant Colonel Summerall and Thibodeau. And then the third one may be uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Wilcox. So the first question that's asked is, was a two-part question and, oh, was it already answered? It just disappeared. Apparently it was. So we're gonna move over to this question that is, uh, from from Jack, and thanks Jack for sending this in. Uh, 
There was a recent article that stated repeated war game exercises show China intends to deny the U.S. its supply bases and thereby air superiority. The article stated that this strategy is from watching both wars in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. Each time the war game is ex exercised or executed, the U.S. loses fairly quickly. If this is true, what is being done to counter the Chinese plans? So I'm not sure if Lieutenant Colonel Semero with the uh, air defense ideas could, could chime in on that one or if someone else would like to. And John, I'm, I'm happy to lead off here. So I do have a little bit of um, congressional background experience and watching the Senate Armed Services Committee's actions on this, I think are very telling. So what the Senate, Senate Armed Services Committee did in, in addition to the House Armed Services Committee, um, they enacted the Pacific uh, Deterrence Initiative. So what they're doing is they're bringing money online and that money is explicitly going right now to revamp our logistics supply lines. So this is a known line of effort. It could be a vulnerability uh, depending on, on how they would go about doing that. So in conjunction with US Congress and the executive branch, we are working towards initiatives to make sure we increase our logistics capability, um, become more disparate in, in logistics and really realize how we would have to execute uh, from a global arena for this. John, I, I can chime in a little on this if, if you're all right with that. Sounds great, Chuck, thanks. Um, <clears throat> no, that's a great question. And uh, you know, I, I think you understand that the, the military conducts a lot of war games and simulations and, and rightfully so. We do them at the worst case scenarios possible, the most difficult, the most strenuous, and, and I would expect the American public would want us to do it that way. Um, kind of what's being done about that, uh, there's a lot of new strategy and doctrine and, and theory out there that's, that some of it's being implemented now, and you heard Colonel Thibodeau talk about a lot of funding there from the Indio PACOM commander that he needs to enact it. Some of it's being enacted right now. Um, and it boils down to uh, the, a kind of what we're just calling a multi-domain strategy. And that's just, uh, and I know you reference Afghanistan, Iraq, and you usually look in the past and we talk about air, land, and sea. Um, our doctrine now is, is in planning and things like that are involving both space and cyberspace. Um, there's also a lot of, um, um, dispersion is going to be of a, a great importance. The artificial intelligence is going to be of great importance and that's being developed now by Futures Command and some of it's actually implemented. Uh, that allows you to get ahead of the decision-making cycle and process there with, with better intelligence and information sharing, um, as well as greater and longer range precision standoff type munitions. But before any of that gets to that, um, it's really important to understand that there's a lot of, 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 of escalation of uh, rings of the ladder that have to be crossed before it gets to that. And generally, rational actors are going to have cooler heads before it gets to that point, especially between two nuclear powers there. And so that all has to be kind of factored in. Uh, but once again, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we do do simulations and war games, and they're always banked upon a worst case scenario because the American people expect the United States military to, to, to operate in any case scenario. Over. Great. Great. Thank you, Chuck. The next question comes from Eric, and it says, uh, also, I'm sure it would be viewed as very proactive by the Chinese, but do you ever see a large scale forward deployment of U.S. military forces in Taiwan? Steve, would you like to answer that one? Sure, John, thanks. Uh, good, good question, uh, Eric. Uh, I was reading that in the chat a little bit ago when you, when you posted it and, and I was thinking uh, the best way uh, to answer it. But uh, I think if you consider every single possibility uh, and the United States military keeps every possibility open uh, across the globe. Uh, whatever it takes, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nell just talked about, there's various uh, escalation procedures and various deterrent options that we will take. Uh, and we are looking for ways to expand our presence 
uh, across the Pacific uh, and have a presence uh, closer towards uh, mainland China. So uh, a large scale deployment, um, you can define multiple ways. Two carrier groups in the South China Sea is a, a fairly robust deployment into the area. Uh, and having those carrier groups uh, in the area at all times uh, is something that does not go unnoticed by China. Uh, but certainly uh, as, or as hostilities potentially escalate, uh, we remain uh, in a position to continue to move forces wherever they're needed uh, in order to uh, enable cooler heads to prevail uh, where, wherever the aggression uh, is, is shown. Uh, over. If, thanks. Uh, John, I think you might be the best one to answer this next one. Is there concern right now between China and Japan, uh, perhaps initiated unilaterally by Japan, a preemptively, I'm sorry, a conflict? Is there, is there concern of conflict between China and Japan? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Art, no, I, I think the answer is uh, probably not. Um, Primarily because both countries have a great deal to lose out of a conflict like that. Um, the now certainly there is some cultural enmity between the two or enmity between the two uh, uh, two nations that need to be addressed. Uh, but in general, the I think both countries are very comfortable with the sense of detente uh, that they currently have. Um, and frankly, I think that the Japanese recognize that. Uh, the, the, between the geographic distance between the nations and the simple numbers that uh, the Chinese currently have, uh, the, the Japanese would, would, would lose uh, a, a great deal in, that, in any kind of conflict that, was, that uh, occurred between those two countries, and certainly China would too. So uh, just, just kind of to put a bow on it, the, um, the economic losses between the two countries make, make a conflict like that prohibitive. Yeah. Thanks, John. The next one is specifically for Leslie, and it's asking uh, for more clarification. Did you say that not only do you, we have to worry about the uh, U.S. military potentially going to war against Chinese forces, but also Chinese Skynet? Yes, John. So, Eric, that's a great question. Um, cyber is very, very heavy in their military development modernization plan. So what China is seeking to do is they're lo looking to bring what's called military civil fusion online. And it's really, at this time, I, I need to do more research to really get a sense of it, uh, because the answers you'll get out there is, are, are pretty disparate on, on what kind of success they're having. But they want to be able to do, it, in my estimation, will be called commercial off the shelf. They want to make that just unique and part of their culture. Whatever's being developed in their, in their country, they think it should be readily available for military use. And they should be sharing um, to develop the military capability in lines with, with other uh, commercial type development. However, some of the research I've done shows that there's a very, very high level of entry to be able to get their civilian companies or corporations able to work in the classified realm within the, uh, the Chinese military. So the People's Liberation Army um, works, it works very well in secrecy, keeping their information close. So there's a whole series of vetting that those companies have to go through to be able to make it um, so they can work jointly with the military. So they have a strong desire to develop military civil fusion but they have some hurdles to overcome on how they, they break down those barriers without compromising their own information. But cyber, I think, is one thing that we need to watch how exactly China develops its capability with cyber. Their goal by 2035 is to be able to get into our systems and shut our systems down before we ever get our assets out and forward into armed conflict. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate that. Follow on. The next question, I'll try to start the answer and then I'll turn over to my teammates. But uh, how do, how do you can compare or contrast the policies of President Trump and Biden from what you know at this time? I will start with the, na uh, the national security strategy is how the national defense strategy is, is made, right? And then there's documents that come all off of that, all the different strategies come off of that. And because that has 
that, that is um, not changed at this time, that's the way we are still operating. And then now I'll turn over my teammates for any follow on. Yeah, I can jump in just real quick, John. Um, I can. So the uh, policies themselves haven't necessarily changed a great deal between the administrations, but the tone has, if that makes sense. Um, obviously, President Trump was a lot more comfortable using social media and direct communications, uh, and which was a bit of, a, of an anomaly. Uh, most, most presidents tend to use other, other forms of statecraft. Uh, and the pre I think President Biden's uh, approach to this has simply been uh, more of the classical version uh, in applications through uh, Department of State communiques, official state visits, and things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, it, it's not, but it's not, I would say, categorically different. It's certainly not a sea change from what President Trump put in place. Um, in fact, I think a lot of people were very surprised by the recent uh, Secretary of Defense's uh, verbiage uh, on China as the pacing threat. Um, and that certainly sends a message to the world that we are focused very heavily on, on uh, some of the uh, Chinese actions that make them uh, bad actors in some ways, uh, and, and we need to address those, those issues. So um, I hope that uh, kind of gets up to your question. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, appreciate that. All right, and the next one is, oh, Chuck, you wanna say something? Yeah, I was just going to piggyback on that question because it's it, it's a great one and we can really only speculate right now and of our own personal thoughts on the Biden administration there because it really hasn't been, uh, we haven't seen that concrete of stuff there coming from them. But as John Wilcox pointed out, you know, there's just a lot of change in rhetoric. Uh, that's that's been about That's been about what we've seen. Most of the policies remain very, very, very similar. And what you really see is, and I'll make it even broader than just the last, uh, this administration, the last, but if you keep going back to, to my discussion during my presentation, it really gets back into this kind of international relation theory where you kind of have this liberal international relations theory of let, let's bring you along into the international community, let's regulate your behavior so you'd buy by international norms. And then kind of the realist thought of it's a zero sum game and we need to get the, we need to take power away from you and prevent you from doing things um, to regulate behavior in that regard. And so what I what I think we've seen over the last few decades is kind of a bracketing between both those international relation policies. It's not one or the other, but I think you're seeing these these become more and more metered in there and refined kind of as, as a international relations theory on how we interact with China and a carrot and stick approach to, to, to modify their behavior over. Thank you, Chuck, appreciate that. The next question is directly for John. And the question is, what effect can sanctions have on China? Is China moving towards economic self-sufficiency and away from export dependency economy? And if so, can san sanctions be effective? Do you think that EE sees the US as being in inevitable structural decline? And both uh, very, very uh, relevant questions. I appreciate that. So um, to the first question, what, what effect do sanctions have? I mean, it's, it, so China uh, is very restrictive on information and any release of information they, uh, they have is, is carefully forecasted. So um, if sanctions are having a deleterious effect on the Chinese economy, they're certainly not going to tell us outright. Um, but we can surmise from some, uh, some of the recent uh, uh, communiques that have gone out. In fact, uh, last week, China just uh, closed down a uh, one of their big multi-year uh, events where the entire CPP will get the Communist People's Party will get together uh, and lay out goals for the upcoming years. This was one of the first times uh, that they had not laid out specific GDP growth goals, um, and that could be attributable to, uh, to COVID-19, or it could be the fact that sanctions are working, or it could be a combination of all those things we don't know. Um, but what we do know is based off what the Chinese are telling themselves, they're, they're hedging a bit on the growth goals that they had put in place before, which I think you can interpret as things are slowing down a little bit for the Chinese expansion. And so they, they recognize that even uh, the uh, outrageous pace of growth that they had early in the 2000s just isn't sustainable anymore. Uh, and I think that they also identified that their, their debt rate is something on the order of 280% of GDP, uh, which sounds astronomical, but then you know, 
you compare it to some other nations in the world too, and it's, it's relatively high as well. So uh, ballooning debt, an economy that's slowing down, uh, I think you can at least uh, expect that sanctions had a part of that. Now, the problem with sanctions though is because of the way that the Chinese have worked most of their relationships with their international partners up to and including us, a lot of those sanctions that are getting flipped right back around on, on the nation placing the sanctions on China. So in a lot of ways, we got word back from several civil nations who, who uh, rely on Chinese manufacturing that tariffs went up on products that they rely on, on importing to maintain that their, uh, their balance sheets. And so while we may have put tariffs on them, they, they, they put them back on the businesses that rely so heavily on, on very cheap Chinese labor. Uh, and then does, does Xi see the U.S. as being inevitable structural decline? So they don't necessarily uh, address the United States uh, directly in any of their, uh, their paperwork. I think if you look at the, the fifth plenum that just, uh, the, the paperwork that came out from the, from the recent fifth plenum, uh, they call it other countries or other, uh, other nations when they're sort of talking about us. So they're very careful not to specifically say the United States does this, uh, does these things, or we're targeting the United States. But I think given the, the sum total of their activities and when you really look at the, the, the breadth of uh, the types of attacks that they, they uh, at least underwrite informationally and economically on the United States and other Western powers, you, you can assume that uh, if they don't believe that we're in a structural decline, they're certainly trying to affect that. Uh, but I, I think it's important to note that that's not necessarily China attacking us in a way to take down the United States, because they do rely on us for, for their economy and we on them. So there's some uh, symbiosis that we need to acknowledge. Uh, but I think that we also need to understand that a lot of those attacks are meant to keep us focused inward so that they can continue to expand while they uh, make use of the fact that we've got our eye off of China and, and we're focused more internally. And we need to start to understand why they do what they do and, and return that focus where it should be, which is on the nation that's trying to uh, to stabilize us and slow down our economy. Thank you. Thanks, John. Next question is going to go to Steve. And the question is, is China trying to achieve a modern military by 2027? If so, do they hope to have a global reach or are they focused more on areas closer to home, such as the South China Sea? South China sea? Oh, great. Uh, great question. So I would answer yes and yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, in the respect that uh, do they hope to modernize? Are they modernizing? Yes. Do they have a goal of 2027 or beyond? Uh, they would love that to be tomorrow. Uh, and as we talked about, as their economy grows, uh, it enables them to commit more money towards defense. Uh, probably a couple particular areas that they've been looking at, uh, enhancing what is already the largest Navy in the world, uh, looking at uh, ballistic missiles uh, with increased range, uh, and then probably uh, air defense, uh, another system that, that they are, are one of the global leaders in, the, in an integrated air defense, really in defense of the homeland. Uh, then the, the second uh, piece of that, uh, are they interested in uh, global reach? Well, I think they're interested, uh, as we talked about, in global influence. Uh, when we talk about global reach, uh, they've never shown or had a penchant for uh, an expeditionary force as we uh, really uh, that mirrors the United States as we deploy forces uh, across the globe. Uh, a lot of it is focused on defense of the homeland, uh, but also protection of their interests uh, wherever they are. So uh, when we look at global reach uh, in ways that China is potentially trying to attain that global reach, uh, you'd probably look towards their ballistic missile program, uh, their ability to uh, extend some of their naval uh, lines uh, and the ability to uh, potentially to establish and enhance commerce uh, across the globe and their influence uh, with their Navy, uh, not necessarily uh, in a expeditionary uh, war fighting type of manner, uh, like we would think of a bunch of uh, paratroopers landing in California. Uh, so I think that's the, the best way to sum it up, uh, the second half of that question. But uh, thank you. That was, a, that was a great, great question. Appreciate that, Steve. I think that ties into the next one from uh, Gregory asking, what is the U.S. doing in regards to the Philippines' seemingly passive control of the islands and China's development of these island, islands? 
I, I can jump in there I, I, since I have a little bit of experience in, in both places. Um, so the, the Philippines regards those islands as theirs and the Chinese regard those islands as theirs. Uh, and uh, it, for the most part, they're using the finder's keepers rule where uh, they have rolled in a fishing fleet that is taken sort of a geographical control of those places. They have placed people in some places uh, and started to build up on some of those islands. And, and you know, you've probably seen pictures on the internet of uh, you know, a person in a tiny little hut that's on this little rock in the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean. And that's, I mean, that's how big some of these things are. But the problem is, is that for the, for the Filipinos, for a lot of them, these are uh, traditional fishing waters that, have, that they've had uh, open access to for years. The Chinese have, have ignored essentially them fishing in those waters because they were uh, those that they were not as critical to the expansion of Chinese interests and goals at the time, but um, they have chosen to uh, draw what they call the nine line demarcation uh, line out, out there to uh, essentially encompass all that space and they say this is ours and we need this to protect uh, Chinese interests on the land. So. Um, as far as U.S. In, uh, involvement in that, I think you know, from a policy standpoint, our interest is making sure that our ally, the Philippines, does not um, get, find itself embroiled in an open conflict with the Chinese, and to ensure that the Chinese are not uh, misusing their position of power to take over uh, parts of, of the globe that uh, they either don't have, have claims to or uh, are using excessive force to, to, to lay claims on. So um, I, I think it's just important to note that uh, our, our interests are in making sure that peace is, uh, is maintained or at least status quo is maintained for now while the two nations uh, try to figure out how they want to, uh, to parse that land out. Thank you. Thanks, John. I just wanted to put out the public service announcement that as much as we'd love to get to every question tonight, there's 20 in the queue right now and I'm going down the list, but we're doing our best to answer all of those and we're gonna to continue to continue on with that and with the next question being, um, but we will have a cutoff point at some, um, some point, I'm sure uh, Sydney and Lacey will let us know when that is. But at this point, uh, the next question is, given what we saw recently with the Russian solar wind cyber attack and that we know that China shares similar skills in the cyber arena. Can, we, can you say anything about how we respond or the US responds to these sorts of incidents? Is it correct to assume they seriously complicate relations at this time in the short term? Do they affect things long-term? And if so, how? Hey, John, I can take a stab at that and because that, that's a fantastic question. I believe Eric Dahl asked a very similar question there. I'm reading in the chat about Chinese cyber warfare and the power grid using the southern U.S. as, a, as an example as well. And if those are war gamed and, and, and things of that nature. So in both those questions, what I have to say is, you know, you got to look at the United States um, when we talk about the homeland. Um, that's, you know, we talk about. Um, our federalist society, uh, first off, and then we talk about the authorities of the active military um, and those restrictions based upon them to exercise some of that authority within the homeland. Um, so that, that needs to be taken account and people need to kind of understand the, the, the ability of that and you know, how the founding fathers structured all of this. And so when you talk about cyber and you talk about a lot of our infrastructure in the United States, I think everyone needs to kind of understand is that the vast, vast majority of it is privately owned, it's city owned, it's state owned, or it's a co-op. And the federal government can't go and control every single one of those entities. Uh, and then perhaps some of the people in our audience probably believe that, that they shouldn't. And, and they've got great arguments to say why not. And so what it gets down to is how do you incentivize the infrastructure of the United States to have better cyber defense, uh, to protect their, their assets better. And so a lot of this is handled through the Department of Homeland Security and through Congressional uh, Congress, their oversight, they're giving you know, grants um, and some regulations there to help structure and, and incentivize 
uh, people to, to have a little more robust cyber defense in those regards for key capabilities back in the United States. Um, so th there, there's that going on there. And there's, there's an agency with under the Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA, the Cyber Information Security Agency, that is responsible for that. Um, it's a building agency. It's gaining more authorities as time goes on. But right now, it's really information sharing of alerting private, uh, public, and, uh, um, and city-state entities there of, of threats there of what's going on out there. And then, of course, you have the United States military cybercom that deals with threats external to the United States there. And so, I mean, I think everyone would be naive if, if we weren't doing cyber activities against aggressive hostile nations there or adversarial nations and i'm certainly we're doing that and it's a very threat uh, big threat and we are certainly certainly it plays a major role in simulations and war games there um and we take that into great account and i'll uh, let me, one of my colleagues uh, answer a little bit more over I think that was uh, sufficient, Chuck. And we're going to move on to the next question. Next question is from Blair, and she asked, or he, he uh, asked, with the American and Chinese economies so intertwined, how has the fact that China has become the U.S. largest trading partner impacted the regional tactics employed, and what kind of balance, if any, must be worked on between the geopolitical military presence and economic trade collaboration? A lot of a lot of great questions on the information and economy space tonight, um, Blair. Thanks for your question. I, I think uh, without kind of going over uh, my allotted time, because I think I probably have, uh, I, I will say that um, I think the answer is that we need to diversify uh, our partnerships while not eliminating partnership options within within the region. Um, so tariffs. Tariffs exist and tariffs are legitimate uh, means of, of statecraft, uh, as are a lot of the ways that we interact with other nations in, in the region. The, the problem, at least in my, my view, is we have put a great number of our eggs into the Chinese basket. Uh, and we've done so because it, uh, it has assisted a, a lot of businesses. Uh, it, we've done so because it has enabled a very cheap degree of trade and, and frankly a lot of a lot of businesses have, have moved their production into China because of that. Um, I think that if you kind of read the tea leaves in the news right now you can see that uh, a lot of nations are really trying to reinvigorate interest from the uh, uh, from the United States in investing into their countries. So places like uh, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, Japan, uh, Malaysia even, and I think Singapore is, is throwing their hat in the ring as well. So you've got a lot of, lot of smaller countries with a little bit less robust um, production capability than China who have been good, uh, reliable partners for us that I think would happily take on some of these, these production. And in doing so, what, you, what you've created now is a bit of competition with China. So uh, as I stated earlier, it's unlikely that we're going to decouple from China. I think that's, that's, that's not a great idea. Um, but we do need to at least let them uh, make them work for our business is probably the best way to put it. Uh, and we need to make sure that any, any agreements that we, ha that we have with China are well, uh, well monitored to make sure that they are meeting the, the expectations of a nation of its size and uh, to, you know, one that, that, that espouses a desire to work within um, you know, as, as one of the greater nations in, on, the, on the planet. Uh, so I think that's kind of a all over the, the place answer for you. But the bottom line is competition, uh, and we need to we need to spread the economic uh, opportunities to other partners who can take it on and continue to place pressure on China to be a better partner in the region. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. The uh, next question is about uh, what was mentioned in our our presentations earlier, when the Indo-Pacific strategy was discussed was mentioned that we need to deter prior to the first island chain. Do you feel that this is actually a responsible expectation? I can take that one, John. So just to clarify, I may have uh, misspoke if I said 
uh, deter as it was in the chat. Our, our first objective is to deny uh, the Chinese the first island chain. Uh, and when we try to deny, uh, it's all of the actions that we take uh, to prevent them from using any of those islands uh, and establishing uh, dominance there or establishing strong points there. Uh, so uh, a little uh, different nuance, uh, I probably misspoke and said deter. Uh, deter would uh, be actions that we're taking uh, in order to potentially slow down their effort to get there, uh, not necessarily uh, to the to the point of denial. A small nuance uh, in the verbiage. And, and do I think that that's uh, realistic or an attainable goal? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so far, 100% uh, success. Uh, and we need to keep those uh, efforts going uh, to deter those efforts, uh, number one. Uh, and then if they do make aggressive efforts to get into the, that first island chain, uh, deny them uh, those actions. Uh, and you see that happening uh, all the time, uh, whether that's uh, combined exercises uh, in the area, uh, whether that's carrier groups, uh, our presence there. Uh, and then also uh, we seek to expand our presence, uh, as, I, as I talked about, uh, as Indo-PACOM looks for uh, more money uh, in order to establish uh, presence uh, in that island chain to get us closer uh, and get some of our systems closer uh, to mainland China. Those those efforts uh, in total uh, send a message that uh, if they want that first island chain, uh, it's going to come at a cost uh, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, and I would submit that uh, that type of messaging and those actions, uh, although working with our partners in the area, uh, China understands that uh, and they understand uh, that if they can have influence, uh, if they can spread uh, their economy, uh, if they can work with people in the area, uh, short of putting uh, their Navy, uh, their armies uh, in harm's way uh, in order to achieve their uh, strategic goals and things that are in their national interest, uh, they will actually do that, uh, as John talked about in the slide, and keep things under uh, the threshold of armed conflict uh, with an adversary. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, so the next question dovetails off of it and it's saying, does the U.S. have any initiatives in place to deter the Chinese from creating more artificial islands? I can uh, I can hit that, John, uh, briefly. Um, so the initiative is, isn't, you know, we're not out to see conflict. Um, what's done is done, um, but you can you you can circumvent that and kind of in in and uh, have the same effect is is not doing that. And what we call that is uh, freedom of navigation. Um, we can do that in the air. We can do that in the sea. And we do that all over the world. That's what the United States Navy does and the United States Air Force does almost on a daily basis in contested areas that the international community deems as a global commons, uh, the, the air and sea space that, that, that anyone has the right to transit. And so we do very frequently there in the South China Le uh, Sea along this thing, say freedom of navigation, where we send some of our warships there uh, most of the time with uh, allies and partners in the region. Um, and we go in there and we make a point that we can sell this and this is not your you know, this is not your exclusive area. This is not within your uh, exclusive economic zone. And we make a make a point about doing that and demonstrating the freedom of any country to go there and not recognizing the right of that island. Um, we're trying to keep, once again, we're trying to keep this below a armed conflict. And we can do that in other ways, which I just described instead of uh, firing shots, which I believe no one no one wants to do. Over. Excellent. Thank you. Next question is, I gathered during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, one thing that prevented total war between the U.S. and the USR was that theory of mutual assur assured destruction. Did the Chinese follow the similar theory? So John, what I can offer on this is I do believe China is part of the no first use for uh, nuclear um, assets, which is definitely a, a positive uh, indication 
So as Chuck just mentioned, uh, China, we believe, seeks to stay below the threshold of armed conflict. However, to assert more authority in the region, they're building their military capabilities. So I'm not sure that we're at the point of mutually assured destruction. It would be extremely, extremely costly for the U.S. and all, all of our allies if we did get into armed conflict with China. However, I believe China, where they're at in their capabilities right now, they wouldn't have the ability to, to project power and overcome our forces. So I don't think they're at the point of mutually assured destruction where they are signatories on the no first use nuclear. Great, thank you. Next question from Malvin it says, I have done business in China for a number of years. From a business competitive standpoint, the U.S. is at a disadvantage in comparing the ability of Chinese leaders to the throw personnel, material, and te techno te excuse me, technology focused to a given goal without needing to address social, legal, or administrative safeguards or regulations. Does this not apply in evaluating the efficiency of the U.S. military and the Chinese military going forward? Go Steve, ahead, Leslie. go ahead. Oh, I thought Leslie was going to take it. Uh, I, I hopefully will answer it a lot. And I'll, then I'll turn it over to Leslie to, to elaborate even more. But uh, I would say uh, no, that theory uh, of being able to, to, to do anything does not necessarily apply in the same way if you're talking armed conflict. At some point, your adversary runs out of stuff. Uh, and no matter what they want to throw at it, uh, they, have, they are in a position of uh, severe overmatch. So I would not think that the Chinese doctrine would adhere to the theory of just keep throwing more stuff at it um, and hope that it goes away or hopes that it deters us. Uh, at some point we have defeated uh, their defense mechanism uh, and we've established a position of dominance uh, around them uh, to achieve our objectives uh, in the area. So uh, although yes, a great uh, example of of the economy uh, and their ability uh, to commit the, a whole of government approach to areas that they find of interest. Uh, when it comes to the military, uh, at some point you are out of ships, you are out of soldiers, uh, you are out of air defense mechanisms. Uh, so uh, there's not anything more to throw at it. So Leslie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hey Steve, yeah, I think that was a great answer. What I'll add to the conversation is another element is leadership and the capability to actually put assets to use or forces to use. So in some of the studies, what I've seen is China may be struggling to develop its military leadership concurrent with its modernization capabilities. So a couple of years ago, there was um, a corruption scandal that came out with one of their high ranking uh, chiefs of joint staff who was accepting bribes for promotion. So they looked into that thoroughly. They found maybe as many as open source reports, 70 officers, both active and uh, former uh, military um, paid for promotions. So what they did is they demoted those who were found to have paid for promotions. They promoted some early leaders early, and now they're adding all sorts of new organization and force structure and how they operate. So while I think they are very strong pulling technology in and advancing that, there's the ability to be able to put that to use. So there's going to be a lot of training that needs to go behind all that technology and how they actually employ it for their newly organized force. Thanks, Leslie. Next question is, what types of advanced intelligence are we developing to address, address Chinese aggression? Uh oh. Leslie and I are going to have a, a geek off here. Um, so gonna, I'll let Leslie go first. Are you going to go from the Army perspective or the Air Force? Well, why don't you take the Air Force perspective first and I'll, I'll, I'll do the Army one. Okay, so for, for the Air Force, if, um, if you follow the Chief Staff of the Air Force at all, uh, General Brown, the initiative here um, that the Air Force is really passionate about is joint all domain command and control operations. So it's, it's not just an Air Force. Um, hopefully John Wilcox will fill us in, uh, you know, from the Army perspective, because they're developing 
concurrently and now they're coming we're coming together joint but what you'll see is a lot of us getting our systems to talk to each other to be able to employ artificial intelligence that way right so we got to get that information big data all incorporated together we got to be able to link all these great combat systems we have to achieve overwhelming effects and the program that the air force um, is strongly strongly working on right now and actually stood up a new organization out at Nellis Air Force Base to focus on it is the Joint All Domain Command and Control. So, John Wilcox, what were you? Yeah, no. So Leslie's exactly right. The Joint All Domain uh, construct, I think, is is driving a lot of this, and and uh, you know, I think it will surprise nobody when we say that up until uh, really recently, we still had a lot of systems between all four branches of the military, and now the with, with Space Force coming online that don't talk to each other uh, seamlessly. Um, and so when you hear people in the military talk about uh, artificial intelligence and big data and quantum computing and things like this, um, there is a systems focus to it and that it's, it's a means of enabling military operations. And so that's important. And we, we wanna focus on that because it, it, it makes us faster and better and, and that we can share information better, uh, more readily. Um, but there is also a function uh, aspect of that too and that gets into you know, a lot of the information attacks uh, data attacks I discussed earlier uh, and so really what we're trying to do is simultaneously make our cells faster and better and more agile and able to share data in a more comprehensive way um, because the size and scope of that data is so massive right now we don't have the ability to process and don't have computers that are big enough and fast enough that can process all that data uh, fast enough and accurately enough for so it slows down the process of decision making so really for from a military standpoint all of these systems that we're putting together are trying to close that decision loop and make it tighter uh, and make make it uh, make it so that a, a mission commander on the ground can quickly uh, ascertain what's going on make a decision and put that decision into action and then bring resources to bear on, on that decision um, but the other uh, variant of this too is there's there's a non-kinetic aspect of it or a non-combat aspect to it. So uh, if you look at what was going on in 2016, we know the Russians were, were playing in some way in, in the information space and how, how uh, Americans were getting information on the election itself. So there was some kind of en engineering going on there. Well, a lot of that was done with misinformation or disinformation using bots, using social media, um, putting out mass amounts of information uh, and overwhelming systems to the point where you didn't have time or ability to go back and fact check information. Or if you did, you'd, you'd find something else that was backed up on top of it that would make you think that this was a legitimate source. And so it really confounded the problem as far as getting access to accurate information. And so uh, thrown on top of that, these te the, the technology uh, is coming online now where I could take a picture and a video of myself and put somebody else's face on my face. Um, and we're getting to the point where verbally I can say something and we can adjust my voice to sound like that person. So we're not far off right now from being able to, to having a, a person make a recording and make it look like a uh, like, like some, somebody in, in politics making a statement publicly. And it would be very hard to go back and fact check that. In fact, I think uh, there was recently some some reports on Tom Cruise that had to start his own Instagram account because, or as a maybe as a, a a social media account of some kind, because somebody was putting up deep fakes of Tom Cruise on, online. So we're not that far away from from this kind of uh, interesting space where people can log in and uh, post uh, a, a plethora of misinformation out there. And it would be very hard to determine whether or not it's factual or not. So you've got, again, two threats. You've got the kinetic, enabling faster decisions on the battlefield, getting resources and people on, on target and on place. And then you've got the, um, the applications of the, uh, this advanced technology that allows you to do things and say things uh, in ways we never could before and, and therefore influence populations in ways we never could before. I think Leslie's about to hop back on and point out all the things that I missed. No, John, that was awesome. Um, I just wanted to add that it's uh, with everything that John Wilcox just discussed, 
both kinetic and non-kinetic, there's very serious ethical questions that go along with the use of artificial intelligence. As such, not only the United States, but also um, our NATO partners recognize that. So concurrently with the US, NATO is also working on how do, how do we develop artificial intelligence and how do we do it in lines with, with our belief systems? How do we get those ethical guidelines out there? Um, but interestingly enough, as NATO looks at it, they also need China as someone that they're responding to to make sure we develop artificial intelligence uh, in, in ethical ways. Okay, um, we are at 827, so I'm going to ask John to maybe pick one more question that he would like us to end on, if that's okay, and then I'll have a closing message for us. I'd like to turn over to my teammates. Is there anything out there out of all these questions that are still unanswered that you'd really like to tell, tell the group that's still online? Hey, John, I think, uh, you know, Jack's uh, next question about Russia Sure. Uh, becoming closer to, to China. And as I look down the chat, there's actually a couple other questions that I think the, the answer to that question actually answers a, a few of the, the rest of them. So I'll try to uh, start off with uh, Jack's question and then his follow up and uh, Russia and China becoming closer. Uh, yes. Uh, has China and the United States become closer? We continue uh, is one of our largest trading partners uh, in the world. So, so where those relationships uh, benefit uh, their objectives uh, and where each country can benefit, certainly they will uh, become closer, uh, just like we become closer to folks that we share uh, mutual interests in. Uh, we certainly have not uh, cut China off from taking our goods, nor have we uh, stopped taking theirs. Uh, so if it is in their interest, uh, will they come together in areas? And I think uh, recently um, you saw a story where they uh, work uh, together to build a space station. Uh, also, let's not forget that uh, Russians and Americans are on a space station together. Uh, right now, uh, we've had Chinese astronauts on that same space station uh, in and out uh, for the last 20 years. So, so where it is in a country's uh, best interest, that certainly can happen. Uh, will they become allies? Uh, I think that question uh, more towards will they have a, a type of NATO agreement, uh, which uh, that they formally sign, uh, where they will come uh, to each other's mutual defense. I, I don't believe so. I don't believe that's in either one of their uh, interests to have such an agreement uh, and, and form uh, an alliance. Uh, both of them are doing quite well uh, as, as, they, uh, as they work together. Uh, and then will it, uh, you know, a little further down, uh, do you see them or China uh, overtaking the United States uh, militarily? So, so militarily, we, as we talked about all night, we have to continue to compete. Uh, we have to continue to repeat, compete across domains that in the past we may have been uncomfortable competing in domains that uh, we consider gray area, whether that's cyberspace, whether that's in space, uh, wherever it is, uh, it's a competition. Uh, and we're either going to lead the competition or our adversaries are gonna look for uh, areas where they can have an advantage. So absolutely, will they overtake us? Uh, not as long as we continue to compete. And I think the resolve of our leaders, uh, as long as I've been in the army over the last 21 years, uh, has been that we will compete. Uh, and not only do we want to compete, uh, we want to lead, uh, right? We want everybody catching up to us, whatever that is, whether that's technology in cyberspace uh, or if it's a hypersonic missile. Uh, we want individual countries to look at us and figure out what we're doing, how we're doing it, and ways to defend against it. Uh, so as long as we continue to compete, uh, our adversaries across the globe uh, will look at us uh, and try to figure out ways to stop us. Uh, vice us looking at them and figuring out, wow, that's just a, uh, a bear we can't tackle. Uh, and I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have anything they want to uh, add on to that. Uh, uh, add on to that over. No, Steve, that was well said. So with that, I'd like to say thanks, Steve. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, John, Chuck, for, for all of the, the comments to the group tonight. Thank you, Lacey and Sydney and Margaret. And then also Carrie Weaver, we didn't thank her at the beginning as well for uh, helping me get this all set up at the beginning. Uh, Carrie and I worked on this. So thank you to the, uh, all the attendees tonight, all the participants. We appreciate uh, your time and hopefully uh, you got some information out of this that you enjoyed. And uh, any, anyone else, any final com comments? I'll turn it over to you. You guys.
Okay. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. And I just want to take a moment to also thank the Peters Township Library Foundation and the Beinhauer Family Funeral Home and Cremation Services who helped purchase our uh, Zoom webinar um, membership. So thank you all so much from the Army War College for joining us this evening. It's our, again, as we said in the beginning, our 15th year being able to do this, and we are very appreciative to still be able to do it virtually with you guys. Of course, we look forward to having everyone back in the building when we are able to do in-person programming.